All right, one of the great uh, privileges of going at the end of the day at an event like this, after so many inspiring speeches, in including that last one, which I'm going to build on, is that you get to spend the whole day rewriting your talks. Um, <laughs> And, and what I've tried to do is, is, is put together a, 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 a presentation for you that will address some of the themes of this new book, Future Perfect, and this idea of, of peer politics or peer progressive politics, but also weave together a couple of the themes that we've heard about today. And I want to start just to be centered in this place uh, with a story that's actually not in the book, which is a story uh, uh, about the Pacific Northwest, right? Since, since we're here, it's a story uh, about something that happened in Portland about 10 or 15 years ago, there was a, a guy named Mark Lakeman who was living uh, in a community um, yeah, kind of on the edges of Portland, uh, and he lived at an intersection. And it was like every kind of urban or suburban intersection. Uh, it was pretty bland. Uh, there were a bunch of houses around it. It was pretty much owned by the automobiles. Nothing ever happened there other than cars passing each other. And he went on a trip, he went on a trip to Central America, and he, he realized as he was walking around there that for, literally for, for millennia, the crossroads had been the kind of the hub of civilization. The crossroads was almost this kind of sacred space in society where people came together and where events happened and where civic culture was forged in these intersection points between people traveling in, in different directions. And he came back home and he said, I, I, well, I'm sitting next to this intersection, but nothing ever happens here. And so he decided to try and figure out a way to kind of cultivate something in this dead space. And he had this idea of painting it. He was going to create this beautiful kind of, kind of intersection-wide, slightly psychedelic-looking painting uh, on the road just to kind of give it a sense of identity, and hopefully things would happen. There would be some magic there. And so he, got, he talked to his neighbors, and they thought it was a good idea. And so he went to the Department of Transportation and was like, hey, I'm thinking of painting my intersection. Is that cool? And they said, no, definitely not. Um, <laughs> And they literally said, that is public space. No one can use it. Um, <laughs> and, and so he decided to kind of do it anyway and kind of rebelled against everybody. And, they, and so he painted this intersection. And then little things started to happen at the margins of it. This is Portland, God bless it. And so people were like, let's create a little solar-powered tea station where people can get their tea. And then they opened up a little lending library where neighbors could share books and things like that. And, and it became known as Share It Square, Share hyphen it square. And it, uh, other intersections started to follow suit, and it became this whole movement called intersection repair. Uh, and then it became called city repair, and there are branches of it, and I think painted intersections here in Seattle and so on. And I, I love this. There's just a, a little simple thing here, but it speaks to something very profound, because in trying to improve that little part of the society, in trying to kind of create a new civic space, the organization, the institutional form that was able to make that change um, was, not, was not the government, right? He went to the government and said, I'd like to paint my thing, and they said, no, you can't. Um, and it was not the private sector. I mean, God bless Starbucks, big Starbucks fan, but Sherritt Square did not come about because the Starbucks was built there. It was because there was a little solar-powered tea station that was built there. Um, and it, in fact, what the institutional form that made it possible was a, a network of neighbors, a network of peers. It was folks outside of these big traditional top-down organizations, the corporation or the state, that have come to dominate so much of our lives over the last 200 to 300 years. And I, I realized a couple of years ago, as I looked around at all the things that were inspiring me and all the people and projects that seemed so interesting and, and so much a kind of a glimpse of the future, you just kind of run down the list, everything from kind of the Occupy movement to co-working spaces to participatory budgeting to Kickstarter to open source software to Code for America and C-Click Fix and Wikipedia and Peer to Patent and Airbnb, all these things that are kind of of this moment. They have many different kind of interests and, 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 and focuses, but what they share is this peer-to-peer -peer architecture. They're, they're not traditional top-down organizations. They don't have traditional leadership structures. Many of them work kind of outside traditional market relationships or traditional kind of ideas about ownership. And yet, they're all working and they're doing all these amazing things. And I realized that if you believe in the power of these kinds of peer networks, that it's very hard to figure out where you fit in the political spectrum. 
that we have these cliches about the left and the right in this country and that you know the kind of the right believes in pure market decentralization the kind of libertarian right um, and it's all about getting the government a, a, as small and as kind of out of our way as possible and the left is this b big believer in the power of the state and kind of top-down solutions and putting a safety net under the marketplace and all that kind of stuff but for those of us who believe in decentralized solutions, network solutions, but that aren't necessarily about market-based solutions, and think that these peer network structures can be incredibly powerful, well, it's hard to figure out exactly where we fit. And I think there's more and more of, of us are kind of feeling that there's some great power in these kinds of network collaboration, open collaboration. So I've started calling these people in this, in this book peer progressives. They come out of the progressive tradition, but they're not just about kind of top-down solutions, they're not just about state solutions, um, but they're not just about handing over the reins to the market in the first place. Now, one of the reasons why we can start to make this argument, I think, confidently, in terms of its kind of political efficacy and its capacity for social change, is because we have the experience of the internet and the web and, and Wikipedia and, and open source software. Not the tools themselves, which are very important to a lot of these things, but it's not just about the technology, it's about the process that built these things. So I now live in Northern California, you know, quite near that city, I can see that city surrounded by reality. Uh, and if we were having this conversation 30 or 40 years ago and I got in front of you and I said, listen, there's this new form of organization where people come together collectively without any traditional ownership relationships and build things, um, you would all have nodded to me and said, that's great. I'm sure everything's going very well for you in your commune in Mendocino County. The baskets you're weaving there are lovely, I'm sure. Uh, but it would have been dismissed as being kind of naive and idealistic. But now we can point to things like the internet and the web and Wikipedia and open source software, things where there is truly this kind of collective project where no one owns the web, everybody owns a piece of it. The standards and the protocols that were created in these things were, were created through these peer networks. And we can point to them and say, this is reality. This is not some naive utopian fantasy. What other problems can we solve with this kind of collaboration? And some of those problems will involve a, a, a collaboration between the private sector and, and, and traditional governments. One of my favorite examples is 311, the, the great service um, that's in many cities around the country, the most advanced version of which is in New York City where I used to live. And 311 is a great example of taking a kind of a peer network of extending and decentralizing the, the, the process of trying to figure out what, what are the needs of a city of 8 million people. In the old days, you would kind of say, okay, we're going to hire a lot of people, we're going to be on the government, this is to the lieutenant governor's point from before, and we're going to have them go around trying to figure out where the problems are. The power of a service like 311, where anybody can call in, dial three digits on a phone and say, hey, there's a pothole on my street, or I have this need, or I'm looking for this particular service, um, or our school's closed today, or where do I recycle this? The city both can answer these questions in a kind of a self-interested way, that people get their answers, but at the same time, the city takes in all this data and maps it and tags it and geotags it and is able to learn from all these queries and all these observations coming in. So and effectively, the city has decentralized and diversified, greatly diversified, the number of kind of eyes on the street, to use the old Jane Jacobs phrase. And there's a great example of this, which I experienced firsthand, which is years ago, New York started having this weird problem where um, certain neighborhoods began to smell like maple syrup, just randomly. You'd be walking down the west side, and all of a sudden, the whole neighborhood would be saturated with this really strong smell of maple syrup. And this is, you know, the uh, years after 9-11, and so people are nervous. Uh, they're worried maybe it's a chemical attack from, like, the Aunt Jemima wing of Al-Qaeda. <laughs> and so they're... They're walking around going, what is going on? So they start calling 311. 311 had just opened up. And so they call them and, you know, they say, it smells like breakfast in Chelsea. And everybody's like, what? what? Who's going to call? And uh, so the city sends some people to kind of identify the odor. And they test the air. And it's safe. And so they tell everybody that it's fine. Uh, but it keeps happening. Every six months, another outbreak of this would happen. The city starts to call these things maple syrup events. Um, capital M, capital S, capital E, which is like, I don't know, the worst episode of uh, CSI you've ever heard, right? And so uh, it goes on for years, and then finally somebody in the city says, wait a second, we've got a record of every time somebody called to report an MSE. And we know where they're calling from. 
We know down to, you know, kind of the, you know, the, the block they're calling from in some cases. And they said, those aren't just like calls from concerned citizens. Those are clues. We can figure out where this smell is coming from. And so they analyzed all the MSC outbreaks in the past, and they, they projected it over weather, prevailing weather patterns for the day, and for each of these days. And when you looked it all together, it created this very clear vector pointing back to New Jersey. The smells were coming from New Jersey. <laughs> It was a nice smell, so it's nothing against New Jersey. But, uh, and they like, literally got in their van and they drove over the river and like, went to this point, and it turned out there was this kind of artificial taste and smell flavor factory there where every now and then they were processing the fenugreek seed, which is used in artificial maple syrup substitutes. Now, it was not a terrorist attack, right? Uh, so that was good. This wasn't a huge problem. But the beauty of it is that when they were designing the 311 system, Nobody sat down and said, we should make sure that the software is good at identifying the source of breakfasty smells if it ever happens, right? It was not part of the spec for the software, I guarantee you that. But because they had created this platform, this decentralized, diverse platform where there were lots of people contributing ideas or observations that they hadn't anticipated, it turned out to be very good at solving this mystery of, of where the maple syrup smell was coming from. And that's the power of these kinds of peer networks. They have this amazing ability to kind of surprise the, their founders. If you could have gone back in time to talk to the Twitter guys seven years ago as they were inventing Twitter, Jack Dorsey and Biz Stone and Evan Williams, and said, in seven years, people will be using your peer network to, uh, you know, to start things like Occupy Wall Street, which began with a hashtag, right? Occupy Wall Street was a hashtag for months and months and months before it actually was a movement of people occupying Wall Street, right? Um, if you could have told them that this thing they were designing was gonna be used for political protests all over the world, you, you know what they would have said? They would have said, what's a hashtag? <laughs> because hashtags were actually not part of their service at all. It wasn't just that they didn't have the vision of the political use of it, they didn't even have hashtags. It was users, it was peers who started using hashtags because it was a useful way of organizing Twitter, and only after a long time did they say, hey, wait, our users are doing very interesting things. So when you extend and diversify the people contributing to your ideas and to your civic culture and to your technology and to your government, when you, bring, when you broaden that, the boundaries of civic participation, new ideas become possible. And a big, this is a big point of the value of, of diversity here. This is not just the kind of social tolerance, multicultural diversity, which is really important, but also intellectual and professional diversity. That when we create spaces where people with different backgrounds can come together and, and share their perspectives on problems, not just where they disagree on a political issue, but when the architects come together and, and talk to the electricians and, and talk to the web designers and talk to the lawyers. When you create those spaces, those are the hubs that become increasingly, have historically been incredibly important for innovation and problem solving in societies. We get too focused, we get too kind of compartmentalized. And in fact, historically, to bring it all back home and, and just to you know, uh, get, get over the, the remark I made about Starbucks before, historically the coffee house has actually been precisely one of those hubs. I wrote this book, The Invention of Error, that talked about the, the time that Ben Franklin spent in London. He used to hang out at this place called the London Coffee House. And it was this amazing scene. There were all these people that would get together um, and they would sit there every two weeks or so and drink immense amounts of coffee and talk about electricity and the American political situation, uh, other developments in science and chemistry and new developments in religious thought. And an incredible series of breakthrough ideas and collaborations came out of these coffee house conversations. I actually went back to look for this place, the London Coffee House, to see if there was a plaque by it, because it's a very you know, important place, and there's a plaque by everything in London. And there's no record of it, but I swear to God, there is a Starbucks right where this coffee house used to be. So they, they don't realize it, but they, they, they're, Blair, if we could put a little plaque there, uh, that would be great. But the power of that space, what made it so powerful, is precisely because it did not belong to a single profession. It did not belong to a single university department or to a single corporate division. It was a diverse space, a, a space of confluence, an intersection point of all these different ideas coming together. And that is where innovation comes from, that's wh where new ideas in society comes from, when you have these different tributaries of ideas converging. And I think that is the power of this kind of space. 
right? Because we share a bunch of values. Hopefully we share some of these kind of peer-to-peer, peer-progressive values, I suspect. But we also come into this room with a whole host of different kind of specialized fields of expertise. And it's the exchange, the borrowing, the migration of ideas across disciplinary borders and across particular fields that is going to unlock a, a lot of new ideas in, in the coming days and in, in weeks and months, I suspect. So that's what I want to celebrate today and to thank Eric for, for what we're doing right here. We are painting the intersection. Thank you very much. There are so many incredible cross connections between what both of you have said. Uh, uh, and one of the most basic by, by, things. By the way, can I? The, New York has a pretty good 311 call center. I just think you should take a look at your hometown, San Francisco. <laughs> uh, that's got their own version, that's which right. I think is that's worthy right. of yes. taking a look. Yes. With yes. open APIs with Biz and Evan that we did at Twitter, the first city to do that. I, I, I wrote the original 311 stuff when I was still living in Brooklyn now. Uh, I've moved see, to the West Coast. East Coast I'm, bias. You know, exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, the main thing I'll remember from either of your talks is the notion that there's an Aunt Jemima branch of Al-Qaeda. Uh, so <laughs> <They're out laughs> you kind of mess with my brain here, my whole wiring. That's <laughs> uh, uh, one of the things that I want to ask you both, because you, you both touched upon this, but um, so much of this is about activating citizen power, uh, but implicit in both of what you've said here is, is the idea of leadership. Okay. So how, do, how does all this technology, how do these new platforms, how do this peer-to-peer -peer methodology and culture that's arising all around us uh, change our notion of what it means to be a leader in civic life? Does it, does it? Uh, or, or is a leader now what used to be just called a gadfly or a catalyst or someone who starts a spark and creates a contagion? Um, I'd love to hear you each speak to yeah, that. I'm curious, your thoughts. Well, I think, um, Leaders remain important. Um, the difference that I would say, to quote a, f a, a former president, is um, the, the leaders are, are less and less deciders um, in the sense, and, and here I think that you know, open source software is a, really, is a good metaphor for this. Um, uh, both the open source movement like Linux or, or something like the World Wide Web, um, they, they both clearly have leaders in, in Linus Torvalds and, and Tim Berners-Lee, and there's an initial kind of seed of kind of idea and programming and defining of protocols that happens. But very quickly, both those folks stopped being able to control anything and stopped having any kind of traditional top-down executive control over the movements that they started. Um, and so they stopped being able to say, hey, we should really do this. Um, and all they could do is kind of steer from afar, but mostly just inspire people to kind of join, join the movement. And so I think that's a good model of leadership in this, in this kind of moment. Yeah, I do, well, and I, you know, I, I gave you my construct, but I, it is an interesting question because, you know, people are referring to this age that we're living in as the age of amateurs. And the network capacity to tear things down certainly has demonstrated itself. The Facebook youth of Tahrir Square, the Ignatos in Spain, obviously you were noting the Occupy movement, one, some could argue Tea Party movement, um, and tearing things down, that's just a, that's me. But, um, <laughs> but, but the ability to govern is still questionable. Now the Tea Party can argue that they've had more influence on the governing side, but that, so who are the leaders in that construct? So how do we translate that populism to topple and to tear down in this age. I mean, someone said the other day, you can't tweet a constitution. Um, then again, can you? Um, and so, you know, I just think we're going through this, this radical restructuring of the frame of your question and what it means to be a leader and the capacity to lead as individuals now as opposed to being in that formal role but the informal role in exercising your voice and being able to, again, amplify that voice with these tools of technology, this bottom-up thinking, this network thinking. I, I love your kind of parenthetical, then again, can we? Yeah. Right? <laughs> Which is a great thing to apply, just like the Jacob Soberoff and asking why. Uh, why Tuesday? Why do we vote on Tuesday? Why do we do anything the way that we do, the way we, uh, it, it is? But there's a key word in what Stephen said a moment ago that I want to uh, pick up on, control. Right, Stephen was saying, so leaders today aren't deciders, they don't control things anymore. Uh, you're joking aside about the role of a lieutenant governor, you've been an executive, uh, you've, you've run San Francisco, the, the government which is both a city and a county government, uh, with a budget larger actually than LA's I believe. Uh, yeah. you, uh, you, 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 
when you put yourself in the role of an executive who has to run a city, for instance, um, it's not so easy, I imagine, to say I, let, I release control. Uh, I, I let go of things because I trust the network, I trust the wisdom of the crowd. At the end of the day, you either are or are not going to deliver upon services, deliver upon goals, and so forth. Sure. How do you reckon with that? Well, it's a covenant of the people, by the people, for the people. It's with the consent of the governed. Uh, you're only as effective as your citizens uh, allow you to be. Uh, you know, it was interesting listening to the president in Israel talking about the issue of risk-taking. And risk-taking doesn't occur in a vacuum. It occurs only when public citizens allow for that kind of risk-taking. And so, uh, you know, I, I have about 1,000 employees in my businesses. I have 17 businesses. And, you know, I, I don't run those businesses in every respect. They're run by the folks walking through those doors. I didn't think it was, I, I got what the folks at Starbucks were saying as it relates to these community hubs and that decision making. Uh, and so I think accordingly, government needs to operate along those same lines. It doesn't now. It's, it is you vote and I decide. Uh, and it is about me creating a framework of who's to blame as opposed to focusing on what to do. And there's so many other you know, things that limit our capacity to change that. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, we're, you, it's the old adage, if you want to move the mouse, you've got to move the cheese. Everything we do, we're incentivized to do. We're incentivized for bad behavior. Otherwise, we wouldn't be engaging in the kind of behavior we're engaging in. And therein lies the challenge. We've got to change the incentive uh, for good behavior, uh, and I argue change the relationship between those that are governed and those that are governing. So Stephen, we began this day um, with Howard Gardner um, talking about good behavior, good work, good citizenship, the notion of what's good, right? And how challenging it is in citizenship to come to a collective, uh, sustainable, sustainably agreed upon notion uh, of what's good. And I'm wondering, as you've explored all of these peer-to-peer -peer networks, this rise of what you call peer progressivism, uh, how do we avoid a situation where these technologies, these platforms, allow two completely isolated notions of what's good just to arise? So you have folks from the left networking with one another, reinforcing one another's beliefs, flocking together as birds of that feather and saying, this is what's good, yeah. right? <laughs> and then folks on the right doing the same in a way where like, no, 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 th this is what's good. And never the twain shall meet because our seamless technologies now make it ever easier to filter out what we don't want to hear or don't even know we don't want to hear. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's, very, this is, it's, it's a really important question, and I've, I've kind of tackled it in a, in a couple of books over the years. Um, what I, I agree with you that the, there's immense civic importance to having kind of collisions, living room conversations, collisions between different worldviews and, and disagreements. Um, I disagree that actually that the media has been a force of polarization and isolation. Um, and in fact, there have been a number of kind of extensive studies done in the last couple of years where they've looked at what they call the kind of isolation effect. How isolated are you from differing points of view? And they looked at all forms of media, looked at the, the internet, of course, looked at new forms of, uh, of communication on the internet, and then also looked at real world spaces, offices, clubs, bars, things like that, people where people get together. What it turns out is actually there's very little difference between the internet and, and television um, and newspapers in terms of exposure to different views. There's actually quite a bit of it. You stumble across people, just, even when you watch Fox, there's some you know, person who's sitting there who's the, the poor subject of, uh, of Hannity's rage. You know, um, so you, <laughs> you, know you hear, uh, exactly. And you, uh, but where they found the most isolation, interestingly, is in face-to-face real-world environments. That's where people were actually not encountering when they, because they were in their towns or they're in their communities or on the Upper West Side or in the Mission. And that's where they actually don't have the kind of political diversity. So I think that the, the internet actually is potentially a force for um, kind of depolarization. But it's something we have to work at. And it's something you have to choose in your social networks. And it's the people you follow or the people you like in, in Facebook. You have to remind yourself that it's important to diversify those influences and having the have those living room conversations. And you're seeing a lot of new sites come up, new platforms, Quora.com being one of them, Localocracy, uh, Delphi and others that are creating these frameworks where it's not the king of the hill model, the loudest voices, the most extreme voices, but the best ideas 
uh, that can create a platform for Socratic engagement that's much more civil uh, and is not anonymous. And the great challenge, of course, being online is the anonymous nature of posts and the like. When you actually have to expose who you are, all of a sudden some of that temperature drops. That point itself, actually, and it's fascinating what you're saying, Stephen, about face-to-face -face in some ways actually uh, uh, be, being the, the, the least uh, uh, set up for, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. serendipitously encountering yeah. the, 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 the different, right? Um, hmm. There's one thing that I, I, both of you have thought about this in, in, in your work, uh, have probably reckoned with this, but one of the themes that's arising in our media and technology culture today is this idea of big data. Right, so if those of you, for those of you who haven't, for, to, for, for those of you for whom that is new, is just the idea that today's unbelievable scaled computing power uh, allows us to not only harvest and collect the data, whether it's 311 data or otherwise, uh, that's out there in the world, but then to crunch it in ways that were unimaginable just a few years ago, right? And so there are so many folks in the world of e-government, open government, new technology and government and citizenship thinking about big data is going to answer all our questions, right? And I guess I have, a, as, a, as somebody who is aware of that but not well versed in it, I start with a little bit of, I guess, skepticism. And I want to I probe you both on this idea of, is the answer for us simply getting better crunched numbers and better data on what's actually happening around us? Uh, and, and will that help break apart the um, false stories that uh, predominate in politics, the mythologies that predominate, right? They're, they're, big data will tell you whether or not the welfare queen exists. Big data will tell you whether or not this person who is thrown out there as a kind of symbolic uh, figure in politics is a real thing or a not, a, not a real thing, right? Uh, but the question is, will that matter, right? Because at the end of the day, we kind of want to believe what we want to believe. And uh, um, for both of you, what, what's, how do you approach that? Well, like everything, uh, you know, it get, these things get overhyped. Um, I think it is a real uh, tool. Um, I think it will be fantastic for things like solving traffic problems, um, basic allocation of resource problems. It's going to be fantastic for public health issues. Um, uh, but I don't think, you know, to get back a little bit to what David was talking about earlier, like I, I, I don't, th you know, we have this massive problem, for instance, of rising inequality, right? And I don't think there's, there's no, the, the data will help us see that problem ever more clearly probably, but it's not going to propose solutions to it. And, and I think that, in, in some ways, one of the things that I've been wrestling with a lot since this book came out is, you know, what, what is the kind of peer progressive peer network solution to that problem? Is there something in that next generation of, of, of unions that, you know, that whatever replaces that industrial model of the union um, that, that David was talking about that borrows from some of these peer network ideas? It could be. I'm still in the early stages of thinking about that. I think this room is probably filled with people who have much more complex ideas than I do. But data is not going to be the, the answer to that problem. The solution is going to have to come from somewhere else. And you know, it's interesting. I, my book goes into great depth around this open data movement and putting data sets online. Began in the 1980s, Ronald Reagan took satellite data that was in the vaults of government. Uh, particularly one agency, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Agency, NOAA, uh, that was funded by all of you and kept in government vaults. He opened that data and its data sets up to everyone else. And as a consequence, every one of you in this room have been beneficiaries of it today. GPS, AccuWeather, all of these things came from putting that data out there. Accordingly, as mayor of San Francisco, we started with open data sets that I started putting up, and to Stephen's point, was in transportation, crime mapping, food, deserts, issues of poverty, and we just threw those data sets up, people scraped them, they downloaded them, and they started creating apps for government services. Instead of going, get, download Angry Birds, uh, there's versions of Angry Birds for democracy now. You can go to the city's app store and literally download things that solve problems in your neighborhood. The reality, though, is, and this is the point I guess I'm making, picking up on Stevens, is we don't know what we don't know, which is the genius of this movement. It was the ability for the private sector to form new connections that people in government could never see and start creating solutions that none of us could have ever imagined and see problems that we never saw in the first place. So I, I think it's profound. I don't think we're overstating the significance of this 
era we're entering into of big data and what it can do, not just to identify with clarity and precision problems, but begin to solve problems by forming new connections. The final question I want to put to you both here um, is about, again, back to this idea of good uh, and the notion of how behavior is contagious always, but behavior is especially contagious on networks, right? Um, and or in human face-to-face -face networks that are accelerated by technology. Uh, and the thing about these networks, just like the thing about data, is that it is agnostic as to whether you're using it for good or for ill, uh, to divide or to unite, uh, whatever it may be. And you realize that, uh, as we've talked about before, society becomes how you behave. Your behavior becomes incredibly contagious, right? Uh, and how is it that we set off contagions of pro-social behavior, yeah. of deciding to choose to engage, deciding to choose to participate, even when it seems kind of hopeless, um, and setting off those contagions of, I'm going to do this, and maybe others will start imitating me, and that will cascade, rather than contagions of cynicism, contagions of disconnect, contagions of, I'm just going to go look, you know, do, take care of my own small uh, realm. How do we either, you know, in public uh, office or out of public office, um, set off those kinds of con pro-social contagions? I suspect we had an example of that at work in the last election, which is to say that, you know, one of the big surprises uh, in, in the presidential race was the, the turnout of the 18 to 30 year olds, which everybody thought, you know, there was no way they would come out as much as they came out in 2008, and a lot of the models were predicated on them kind of underperforming, and of course it turned out that they showed up in greater numbers. And I, I, I say this purely as hypothesis, someone should study this, but I, I have to believe that the Facebook and Twitter meme of I voted, which was a big deal on, on election day where all these people were like just saying, you know, hashtag I voted, just went down into that, that all these people saw their friends doing it and it had this kind of contagion of like, wow, well, all my friends are doing it. Um, I, I would not at all be surprised if that was a significant contribution to that greater turnout. So it is that kind of positive peer pressure is something that, that can happen and, and will happen. How you would encourage it, we, we all just, you know, try and remind ourselves. Again, it's about kind of marketing success stories, marketing moments uh, of connection or moments of kind of civic participation and making sure that we we spread those ideas as much as the, you know, the new detergent that just came out. Yeah. Yeah. Kevin, last one. No, I, oh, I, I agree with that. And I think, you know, the, the dust is now settling in the analysis of, of this election and exactly how they use that data mining, data analysis to do the peer-to-peer -peer connection and dive deep into Facebook friends and those networks and create those relationships and get people to vote based not on a politician saying, please vote, but a friend saying, yeah. did you vote? And all of a sudden, likelihood of that engendering behavior change. Look, I think it goes to, you know, what you talk about all the time. We're all better off and we're all better off. This notion that Dr. King talked about so effectively and reminding people of this, that we're all bound together by a web of mutuality. And we're many parts, Bible teaches us, right? Many parts, but one body. It's to continue to remind people of their fate being connected to the fate of others. There is no leak on your side of our boat. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great note to end on and a great spirit to, to carry us into the next and final segment of our day to together. But please join me in thanking and celebrating Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom and Stephen Johnson. Thank you both very much. <clears throat>